Several years ago, the person who led the Holy Week service at which I spoke broke down while reading the Passion narrative from the pulpit. He was a statesman, having served as a cabinet minister in our government. Publicly, he declared his love for Jesus, who died not just for the sins of the world, but specifically for his sins. It was difficult, he said, to read of our Lord's Passion without being emotionally affected. At every Lent season, which culminates in the Holy Week and Easter, we take a fresh look at our Lord's sacrificial love for us. For many of our jaded souls, it takes ever more effort for the suffering of our Lord to be a conscious reality. Very few of us are so deeply impacted by our Lord's suffering that our lives change drastically. Over the years, the events leading up to Easter have been mollified and romanticized. We have become so narcissistic that our senses find it difficult to be overwhelmed by the pain borne by our Lord. Mel Gibson's visual recounting of the story of the suffering Christ captured the minds of our digital generation. The dialogue is in two dead languages and the story has been demythologized by our secular society. From the start, it appeared to be an art film that will not be a box office hit. Mel Gibson had to fork out his own money to make the movie as no major studio wanted to invest in it. But it stirred up a hornet's nest. It was criticized as being out of the reach of a sophisticated audience that would not stand up to religious imposition. Then it was lambasted for being an anti-Semitic portrayal. Finally, it was perceived to be overly violent. When I saw the movie, I was forced to come to terms with the brutal reality of a Roman crucifixion. The cross was transformed from a trendy piece of jewellery and a theological proposition to a cruel reality. At no point in the movie did I think it violent, like Saving Private Ryan, or Pulp Fiction, or Natural Born Killers. The Roman punishment was gruesome, and Jesus was treated inhumanely. So excruciating was his suffering, he cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Gibson plainly declared his perspective in the introduction of the film with the quote from Isaiah. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. With that, the blame for our Lord's suffering and death is placed squarely on each one of us. It was not pointless suffering and death. They were all for us. As the lashes tore our Lord's flesh, I heard my mind rehearsing the words, that was for me. No one without preconceived notions would blame the Jews alone for the crucifixion. The crucifixion was the invention of the bloodthirsty Romans. But each of us can be seen in those who plotted and brought about our Lord's excruciating death. Gibson told church leaders in Chicago, For culpability, look to yourself. I look to myself. So deep was the director's sense of culpability that he grabbed the mallet and spikes from the actor who was supposed to be nailing Jesus to the cross. In the final cut of the movie, the hands that drove the nails into Jesus were that of Mel Gibson's. True, there were details of the film that did not satisfy me. Where the source of some of the events was extra-biblical, they were conjectural, albeit plausible. But I admire Gibson's personal devotion in acceding to the actor who played Jesus. Jim Caviezel's request for a prayer service to be held every day of the filming. Many of my veteran Christian friends cannot even keep 
consistent personal devotions in their compulsively acquisitive lifestyles. More important than my discomfort with some of the material is the power of the story. The passion of Jesus brought the power of healing to Mel Gibson's personal life. In an interview, Gibson said, I went to the wounds of Christ in order to cure my wounds. And when I did that, through reading and studying and meditating and praying, I began to see in my own mind what he really went through. It got inside me and started to grow. And it reached a point where I just had to tell it to get it out. Speaking in a church interview, Gibson remarked, I tried to make something that was real to me. In his foreword to Tyndale House's The Passion, he says the film had its genesis during a time in which he found himself trapped with feelings of terrible, isolated emptiness. He tells of his emptiness, regret, despair, pain. In other words, the film is Mel Gibson's testimony of the power that brought healing to his life and transformed him. Some people recount their encounter with Jesus in a book, others narrate it orally, and Gibson articulated his experience in a way he knew best as a movie director. Evidently, the power of the story has touched the audience in spectacular ways. The Los Angeles Times reported that a 21-year-old man from Texas who had killed his pregnant lover and made it look like a suicide confessed after seeing the movie. The woman's death had already been ruled a suicide by the authorities. He could have gotten scot-free. But after watching the movie, he went to church and announced that he needed to confess a crime and then drove himself to the police. I felt great unease watching the film, not because of the gruesome scenes. What was repugnant was not on the screen, but in my heart. Suddenly, the extent of the darkness in my soul was impressed on me. What I would regularly dismiss with a mitigating rationale was what brought the atrocities on my Lord. The film brought home to me that sin is not academic, the litmus test of one's orthodoxy. It is grave, mutilating, alienating, and deeply personal. As Gibson writes, the film is not meant as a historical documentary. It is a contemplative in the sense that one is compelled to remember in a spiritual way which cannot be articulated, only experienced. And yes, the film was an experience for me. The words of Jeannie Hussey's hymn rang in my mind as I walked out after watching the movie. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, Lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. The theologian Karl Barth reminds us, they crucified him with the criminals. Which is more amazing, to find Jesus in such bad company, or to find the criminals in such good company? Jesus died precisely for those two criminals who were crucified on his right and left. He did not die for the sake of a good world. He died for the sake of an evil world. The passion of the Christ brought home powerfully to me that the axis of evil is not out there, but in my own heart. Heaven's glory was emptied. Eternity's prince was brutally mutilated and killed because of me and you. Hallelujah. What a savior. 
This is the question for you to ponder on and discuss with your group. Thank you for watching and we will see you at the next session.